It turned out that he had physically torn his vocal cords from screaming incessantly. In the height of World War II, Russian scientists wanted to find a way to keep their soldiers awake longer. And so they devised this experiment, this human experiment, to test the effects of extreme sleep deprivation. And so what they did is they rounded up five uh, prisoners of war and offered them their freedom if they went through this experiment, which I can tell you went sideways. And so the way it worked is they were gonna be put inside of this sealed gas chamber that continuously was going to administer this stimulant gas. It was an experimental stimulant gas. This is not something they knew much about, but they were fairly confident that it wouldn't kill them and that it would keep them awake. And so they put them inside the chamber and they started administering the gas. This was not at a time where they had closed circuit cameras. Those weren't around at the time. All they had was, you know, they could put microphones in there um, and they had these five inch thick little porthole windows. They had one porthole window where the researchers could look into the chamber itself. So the experiment begins and really for the first three, four days, everything was pretty normal. At about the day four mark, the researchers started to notice a change in what they were discussing, the subjects. Uh, it went from kind of small talk over those first few days to fairly dark. They started talking almost exclusively about traumatic events that had happened to them in their life. And around the day four mark is when they started, the subjects started complaining about being in this test at all. You know, the first few days it was filled with some optimism that this was their ticket out of the terrible situation they were in. And then it really turned into, this is a terrible situation. I think it was around the day six mark, the subjects stopped talking to each other completely. They became paranoid of the other uh, subjects and they went to their own sections of the chamber. You know, and in, in the chamber they had places to sit, there was food, there was water, there was a bathroom, um, there was books in there to read. Uh, they kind of took up space inside of the chamber. They began to believe that they could kind of like sell out their, uh, their comrades in exchange for getting out of this experiment. So they would, you know, one by one come up to the porthole or go over to one of the microphones that was obviously placed inside of the chamber and start whispering these kind of imagined defenses of the other um, subjects to try to get them in trouble in exchange for being released from this experiment, which, you know, that, that didn't do anything. You know, the, the researchers, they didn't care what they said. They just listened and watched. After nine days, the experiment took a significant turn for the worst. Uh, it was the morning of the, I think it was the 10th day where the screaming began. Uh, one of the test subjects began screaming. And at this point, everybody is totally like segregated. They're not talking to each other. They're muttering and whispering. And one of them just starts screaming. And so for three hours, they watch him scream at the top of his lungs and run back and forth across this little chamber until he stopped screaming, but he's still running. And they could kind of pick up on the microphone that he was still making sound, but it was like these little squeaks. It turned out that he had physically torn his vocal cords from screaming incessantly. The other subjects didn't react to the screaming at all. It was like it wasn't happening, but they're in this confined space, right? It's like so loud in there. And uh, all that happened is as he's screaming, the other subjects began ripping out pages of the book, soaking them, and then pushing them up against the porthole glass, obscuring the view. So by the time the subject who had torn his vocal cords stopped, well, by the time he tore his vocal cords and it went quiet, the researchers couldn't actually see into the chamber anymore. And once the, uh, the guy had torn his vocal cords, there was no more sound in the room. So their view was obscured, and now it's gone silent. After three days of talking about what they're gonna do, of complete silence in the room. Like they can't see in, they can't, it's silent. They're, they're monitoring the oxygen levels in the room and based on oxygen consumption in the room, uh, apparently they could tell that there were people in there, probably at least four or five, that were breathing oxygen because it was, it was being consumed. 
So they believed they were alive, but after three days of silence, which really didn't make any sense, they determined that, well, either our microphones are, are broken and that's a problem, uh, or there's something wrong with the subjects themselves. So they decide that they're gonna use the intercom to reach out to the subjects and basically tell them that they're gonna they're gonna come into the room. Like, hey, you know, we're gonna test the microphones, we're gonna be coming into the chamber, um, you, you need to lay on the ground and, and not interact with us. If you comply, we will offer one of you immediate release and freedom. So there's silence after they use the intercom, they decide to do that, they talk to the, the intercom and one, of the uh, subjects. Now, to this point, again, for three days, it's been silent. And one of the subjects, clear as can be, talks into the microphone and just says, we no longer want to be freed. And so the researchers were like, okay, I guess they're alive and our microphones work, so they don't go in. They, they stay out of the chamber. Silence continues all the way up until the 15th day because, you know, the window's still obscured. The, the subjects are not speaking, they're not muttering, they're not whispering, it's just silence. And uh, on the 15th day, on, at midnight on the 15th day, they, they decide that they're, well, the experiment was over. Um, and so what they did is they flushed the room of the stimulant that had been continuously pouring into the room, they turned that off, and they replaced it with fresh air. And that's when they started hearing the screaming from the subjects inside of the, the chamber. They were begging them, the researchers, to turn the gas back on pleading with them, like begging, please turn it back on as if they were dying. And then they open the chamber and now they're laying eyes on the chamber for the first time since like the 10th day. So it's been like five days. And they're seeing the chamber with their own eyes for the first time. And it's straight out of a horror scene. Four of the five subjects were still alive. The fifth subject who had perished at some point there was chunks of flesh that had been taken off of his chest and his leg and had been jammed into the drain in the center of the room. And they had turned on the water in the bathroom and had flooded the room. There was almost four inches of water on the ground, like murky, stagnant, like, you know, lots of gross stuff in their water all over the ground. And uh, there's this, this dead subject. And all four of them uh, have also, there's chunks of their own flesh that's been ripped off of their body and it was later determined that it was self-inflicted, these chunks of, of meat that had been pulled off of them. Um, and it was not by teeth either, it was by hand. And also they were eating it. So they were ripping off pieces of their body and eating it. The, the food storage that was down there hadn't been touched in days. It was like they had all completely lost their mind and began eating themselves. The subjects did not want to leave the chamber. They just continued to beg for the gas to be turned back on. And so finally they brought in some uh, soldiers to actually extract the, the living uh, subjects out of the chamber, but they fought so aggressively to stay there. And in fact, one of the subjects jumped up and bit the neck of one of the soldiers and he actually bled to death. Also, one of the subjects in the struggle, his spleen ruptured and he bled to death. So now you have two casualties just getting them out of the room. They finally get the, the three remaining subjects, living subjects out of the room and they heavily restrain them. They bring them to a medical facility because they need to go under surgery because they've had chunks of their own flesh ripped off. They're totally emaciated. And uh, the most injured of the three is immediately brought into surgery while the other two were just kind of held in a, in a holding room and they try to give him a sedative in order to, to prepare him for surgery. This is not the anesthetic, this is just the sedative. And, it, and it's like he's immune to it. You know, they give him a sedative, it does nothing. And he's just like resisting them and he keeps begging to go back under the gas. And then finally they say, okay, well, we're just gonna give him the anesthetic now. And when they bring it out and they tell him, we're gonna give you an anesthetic and we're gonna give you the surgery, he starts viciously fighting back. He does not want the anesthetic. He's pleading for them not to give him the anesthetic, that he must remain awake. He needs to remain awake, put me back under the gas. And in his struggle to not have the anesthetic given to him, he manages to tear one of the leather straps that was holding him down. So like an extreme amount of force. And then finally, when they give him the anesthetic, they had to give him like 10 times the dosage or whatever, just to get him to calm down. Uh, as soon as he fell asleep, he died. So after he passes away, they move on to the next worst off uh, subject, the guy who had torn his vocal cords and couldn't speak. They bring him in for surgery 
and he can't speak, but he's, he's shaking his head because he doesn't want the anesthetic. He doesn't want to go under surgery and he's fighting with them. And he actually just passes out from exhaustion. And he too, once he falls asleep or I guess falls unconscious, he dies as well. So now there's only one subject left. The other two that had lived to be pulled out of the chamber have now died as soon as they fell asleep. And, and the scientists don't have any idea why. Instead of bringing the last survivor into surgery, because now they've witnessed two surgeries end in death, they decide let's put this guy back in the chamber and turn the gas back on because apparently that's the one thing that's keeping these guys alive. And so in preparation for being put back into the chamber, they hooked him up with an EEG that basically measures your brain waves, which I guess they hadn't done to this point in the experiment. And so they put him in there and, and the scientists are watching the readout of the EEG. And they noticed that like his lines would just, you know, inexplicably flatline and then go back to, to you know, up and down and then flatline again. And one of them had the wherewithal to look at the subject as it's flatlining and they could see that every time he closed his eyes it was like he was micro sleeping like these little blanks basically every time he fell asleep for like a fraction of a second it was like he was suffering a brain death over and over and over again and as they're monitoring this and they don't they know what just happened to the other two they died when they fell asleep uh they're, they're trying to rush to get the gas turned back on to keep this guy alive but they didn't do it in time and he eventually succumbs and falls asleep and they can see before he ultimately dies that uh, initially when he finally fell asleep, the, the EEG showed that he had fallen into a deep sleep. And then he flatlined and his heart stopped and he died. All of the subjects died and no one really knows what killed them. Was it the sleep deprivation? Uh, was it the gas? It could be a mixture of the two, but we'll never know. But either way, uh, all of them died. Now, this is actually just a story. And there's no evidence to suggest that it's even true. But during that time frame in the 40s, during World War II, there were known cases of horrific, unethical human experimentation happening. Like, uh, you know, the, the Japanese, the, that awful Unit 731, I would not suggest Googling that unless you got a really strong stomach. Um, you had in the concentration camps, the German concentration camps, human, ex human experimentation was definitely happening. Um, and obviously Germany and, and, you know, Japan are not, uh, uh, Russia, but you know, it was just in this era where human experimentation was definitely happening. So even if this particular story, the Russian sleep experiment is not true, uh, it, I, I wouldn't be shocked in the least if there wasn't a similar study done somewhere. Obviously the results could vary dramatically, but I do think that it's certainly possible that something like this could have happened. You know, we continue to study sleep and sleep deprivation, and really there's not much known about it. We don't even really know why we sleep, but we do know that you will die if you go without sleep. I think the longest any human went without sleep was like 18 days. Um, and I can actually speak from my own experience. I was a Navy SEAL for seven years, and uh, we go through something called Hell Week, uh, in initial training where over a period of five and a half days, you sleep for a total of four hours, not uh, every night four hours, but a grand total of four hours. And, uh, and it's split up into two little chunks, two hours and two hours. And then there's like a 15 minute and 15 minute nap thrown in there too. And you really just lose your mind after 72 hours. I remember I was constantly hallucinating that when I was around my classmates, their head would turn into a big Rubik's cube and start flipping around. And even when I got up right next to them, their head would still be flopping around like a Rubik's cube. And that's only 72 hours in. Uh, I can only imagine what would happen at 15 days. So that's gonna do it. I hope you enjoyed the, the my version of the Russian sleep experiment. Go check it out on Creepypasta or just Google Russian sleep experiment. There's loads of stuff on the internet about it. Um, if you're not already, do check me out on TikTok. So my handle on TikTok is the same as my YouTube handle. It's Mr. Ballin. Um, I post videos in there daily. Uh, lots of horror stuff, scary stuff. If you're into that, go check it out. Uh, also, I have an Instagram, uh, John B. Allen 416 is my handle there. More Navy SEAL content on there, but if you're interested in that, go check it out. Uh, and that's going to do it. So please uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Uh, let me know if you want to hear other stories that you think I'd do a good job telling. Let me know and I'll see if I can do it. Uh, and that's going to do it. Thanks, guys.